I'd like to thank you on behalf of the readership of the Arthur Miller Journal for agreeing to sit down and talk about your career, some of the issues in uh, American drama and theater that concern all of us interested in the stage. Okay, well, well, thank you for having you. me. Thank you. I said, well, you've had quite a year, or a year and a half, in what had already been a distinguished career. In the past year, you received the Steinberg Award. You were honored the Inge Festival and the Signature Theater right here in New York devoted the last year to revivals of Golden Child, The Dance on the Railroad, and you completed the new play, uh, Kung Fu, and that's set to premiere at the Signature this winter. So it seems to me that you're in a new phase, or in a, at least a critical evaluation or estimation. So I'm interested in just how you see your career now at this point, because you do have a, a large canon, even though you express surprise when you received that Inge Award that you somehow didn't think you could be considered among the greats who previously received the award and you didn't think you had enough body of work to receive that iconic award. But yet, but yet and I don't want to age you, it's almost 35 years mm -hmm. since FOB. So you must have a different perspective on the breadth and scope of your career. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I feel like I've been, I was fortunate enough uh, to get out of the starting gate quite early yeah, as, a, as a playwright. And so, um, you know, when FOB was produced um, at the public, and my first play was 23. And so, kind of over the years, I've just, you know, sometimes for fun, thought about the careers of other American playwrights, yes. uh, people who've come before, as well as uh, my contemporaries. And, you know, I've tended to feel, okay, there is this, there, uh, there seems to be a pattern. It's not true of everybody, but it is true of a lot of people where they have their sort of big hit, yes. the show that uh, gets attached to their name. Um, which you you know, someplace around 30, yeah, yeah. you know, which is when M. Butterfly happened yes. for me. Um, and then there's like some kind of, usually there's a, a, a struggling period in middle age. And the question becomes, who gets to have sort of a mid-career surge? Um, and who, who's still, you know, who, who do, who's not that fortunate? And so, I do feel like since kind of 07, when Yellowface was produced yes. at the public, that I've been really fortunate to be able to yeah. start to produce work at a pretty, uh, pretty consistent pace. And then all the awards um, were really just a re nice icing on the cake. Yes, very much so. Well, since this is an interview for the Arthur Miller Journal, I thought a couple of times we discuss a few items about Miller as a kind of jumping off yeah. point. Uh, Back in 1990 or 91 sometime, uh, William Henry of, of Time said about you, right. you've has been asked this before, no, I remember that this you part. had the potential to become the first important dramatist of American public life since Arthur Miller. Now you did an interview in, eight, in 96 with someone and you responded by saying that you don't consciously pursue public themes, but that your personal concerns spill over into the public arena. So I'm wondering, at this point in your career, how do you see that tension that Miller always talked about between public and private? Because it seems to me your most recent work tilts very much on the public side. Yeah, I mean, I guess one of the reasons that I uh, admire Miller so much and I identify with his work and it always means so much to me is because I think he does um, uh, struggle, and he's, you know, he spoke about it, uh, with that exact tension, which is, you know, when, f from, to my mind, if you write a uh, so-called political play, if you write a play about um, public life or an issue, which does not also have a kind of deep personal emotional component, it feels incomplete. Mm -hmm. And um, I personally, you know, would, would some of those plays I like, but, but a, lot of, a lot of them seem wanting to me. And conversely, a play which is um, only about internal concerns and doesn't, it, isn't conscious of the larger kind of sociopolitical right. context that it exists in also feels to me somewhat incomplete. So, um, you know, I, I think I would amend to some extent what I said in 96 uh, in that uh, I do find myself motivated by questions. Um, and many times those questions have a, a, a public aspect right. to them. Yeah. So you mentioned Chinglish, and, um, you know, which is a, a play that we did a couple years ago on Broadway, uh, which is about an American businessman who goes to China to try and make a deal. 
and is um, a bilingual play. It's, it's about a, a quarter to third in Mandarin. So at this point in, in, in my life, I find that I'm engaging with a lot of kind of international themes. Yeah. And uh, as someone who obviously is Chinese American and started out writing largely about Chinese American and Asian American concerns, um, the whole US-China relationship which seems to me to be a pretty central story yes. of the 21st yeah. century, uh, yeah. uh, is uh, uh, very much on my mind right now as a person and as an artist. So it seems that's where the shift has come, where some of your earlier work started with your private concerns, yeah. and family concerns that turned public. Now the public comes first in, a, in some sense. In some sense. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. I, I, I feel like, I don't know what comes first. I feel <laughs> like the two have to be, uh, uh, there has to be a very um, seamless uh, uh, mix of the two in order for me to feel really satisfied. So um, starting with M. Butterfly, I think I started to engage more sort of internationalist yeah, themes right. as opposed to multicultural mm -hmm. themes. Um, and then you have kind of those two strains which seem to exist in my work since then. Yeah. Well, sp speaking of the strains that work, you have talked a lot uh, in your interviews and in your writing about stages of your thinking, your political philosophy, mm -hmm. and your early views on uh, assimilationism and nationalism, multiculturalism, isolationism. And somewhere along the line, you th said you became an old-fashioned integrationist. Mm -hmm. Where are you now at this point? Um, I mean, I think I still, I certainly uh, uh, believe in kind of a, uh, maybe a more radical even kind of integration than um, we, we normally uh, think yeah. of it. Um, but I also find myself attracted to what's now being called um, transculturalism. Yeah. This idea that um, we can, rather than having to choose uh, between one nation, one culture, that we have this sort of multiplicity of influences yeah. and that we, we encompass many different cultures and many different nations and to be able to acknowledge all the different uh, influences that you go into Frank, making us who Frank we are. Rich said something in, a, in that forward to yellow face, mm -hmm. where he said you you have erased the borders between cultures. I mean, he, I, I mean, I think that uh, he's well, Frank Rich has always been very kind to me. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like the we have these categories. We have these cultural categories. We have these racial mm -hmm. categories, social categories, which are we all know on an intellectual level are pretty arbitrary, um, and. For me, a lot of the fun, uh, it, I guess in a lot of my work, has to do with blurring those, yeah. uh, those, those lines and showing how the, uh, the categories that we've set up are much more permeable than uh, we sometimes think of them. Yeah. We've been talking about your views now. Let's go back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. Miller was always talking about the beginning, too. So you had your first hit. In you wrote FOB mm -hmm. when you were in college. Uh, and like Miller at Michigan, uh, you're defining experiences. You talk about it. So your formation as a dramatist occurred at Stanford. Yeah. So what was so special about those, those formative years? I and mean, Miller talks about that too. And he says, he said when he went to write his first play, he had to go ask a dorm mate, just how long is a play? Mm -hmm. So you had all those years in the workshops at Stanford. But what was the moment that you said, I can do this? Um, I think it's because yeah. I saw some plays yeah. uh, my freshman year. And I remember going up to um, American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. I saw The Tempest and um, The Matchmaker. And it just made me go, maybe I, you know, I think I can do this. Yeah. I think this, this might be something that, that uh, I have some ability for. Um, and then I took a drama, a contemporary drama class oh, okay. from a professor named John Lerer, who uh, later turned out to be a, a mentor of mine. Um, and so I, you know, I read uh, Miller and Albee and uh, Sam Shepard, and um, so I had a sense of yeah. what the form was yeah. supposed to be. Um, and I tried to write some uh, plays, and I showed that John Lerner was kind enough to look at them and, and tell me that they weren't any good, but <laughs> that, uh, that he essentially then helped me create a playwriting yeah. major. Yeah. And I saw as many plays and read as many plays as I could over the next few years. Um, so I think you know that the, the critical moment was just kind of beginning to see plays, right. and then just really trying to uh, absorb as much as I could and, and about uh, theatrical and literature. You're talking about Shepard, of course. And yes, and, and, and Shepard becoming. First, I was a fan of his work. Then I had the opportunity to study with him um, at the first Padre Hills mm -hmm. Playwrights Festival between my junior and senior year in college, um, 
and he, uh, you know, I feel like he and Maria Irene Fornes, yeah. um, and you know, uh, other playwrights there, Walter uh, Walter Hadler, Mary Mednick, really then taught me how to become an artist um, with with the writing, and uh, that was when I began to write FOB. And then you got lucky with the O'Neill, the acceptance. Of yes, that, that was. You talk about that being the mat, the door opened at that point. Yeah, I mean yeah. that was an amazing opportunity to have access to professional theater, to New York theater. Um, uh, I mean, when I got the notice from them, I was in my senior year, so that was uh, seventy nine. Mm -hmm. I was. Mm -hmm. 2021, I guess. And that was the year you put F FOB on in the, in the, in and, uh, the dorm. And we did FOB in at the, the, dorm. the dorm. And then I got a mailgram, <laughs> because that's how people communicated in those days, uh, that I was on, you know, I was, I was shortlisted for the O'Neill. Yeah, and good. then I got selected. Yeah, speaking of Miller again, I don't know if you realize this, but there, I've realized this last few months, but there are uncanny similarities, parallels between you and Miller and your, hmm. your, your lives. Both of your fathers were successful businessmen because his father had the crash. Mm -hmm. uh, businessmen. Your mother had the passion for the piano. Miller. I didn't know his mother was a pianist. His mother loved Broadway tunes. She huh. loved musical mm -hmm. thing. Uh, his mother's piano is still in Joan Copeland's apartment. Wow. I'm so sure I saw it when mm -hmm. I did it. So he talks a lot about that, his mother's passion for the for for the music. And you both had your first successful plays. In college, you both had masterpieces, true American masterpieces. Early in Korea, you both rewrote an Ibsen play. Mm. Uh, you both worked in opera. The critics have talked about the surrealism in your plays, the expressionism in your play. I think one of the most interesting things about the, what you two have in common is the extensive use of music mm. in the work. And you've done some work as a musician. Mm. So, can you explain why music is integral in almost every one of your plays? We have a Miller scholar who has done work on, on the music in Miller's play, and I think it's almost in every play, wow. except for like two or three. And your plays are the same. When I was first exposed to Chinglish, I'm reading it, I'm reading it, and I'm saying, here's one without the music. And then, boom, mm -hmm. you get to that end when Kai yeah. sings that aria, mm -hmm. and you say, wow, it ties it all together. So, it seems like that's part of your fiber. Yeah, I mean, let me just add one more thing about um, uh, m uh, my history with Miller, which is that that summer when I went to the O'Neill, uh, straight out of college, um, Miller came up. Didn't and know that. And spoke to, spoke to the playwrights. Oh, because I was going to ask you about when you met Miller in 99, when your wife was in right. there. But I didn't realize you saw him before that. Yeah, I, I mean, I was, you know, I, in both times yeah. that, I've, uh, that I can remember meeting Miller, I was basically too shy to really. <laughs> Tony you know, Kushner said that too about him. He was too shy to say something to yeah, him. Yeah, but, but uh, so I didn't, I don't think I had any personal interaction yeah. with Miller in 79, uh, but I listened to him talk uh, and I yeah. was, it was just amazing to be in his presence. So getting back to the music question, yeah. um, I mean, it's probably because I grew up, uh, as I guess yeah. Miller did, with music. Um, we were all, you know, I was a Chinese kid playing violin and um, so uh, it was a big part of my life, um, although I never really liked playing classical that much. And uh, however, when I got to college and I learned to start improvising on violin and playing jazz and, and playing electric violin, then I really liked it and it became a, a huge part of my life for a number of years. So that there's a way in which playwriting for me is, yes, it involves words, but it's also very much like writing music, the way that music is ultimately not about the notes on the staff, and it's how it sounds in the air. And I think it's the same with playwriting. It's about how it sounds in the air. Um, and then I it, use music because I feel, I guess I came up during a period when we were beginning to understand that theater was maybe not going to be able to compete with, theater, with, with film and television in terms of naturalism. Um, and so the, it then became about, for me, trying to find, well, what does theater do better than these other mediums? And there was a movement in the 70s called theatricalism, uh, which I feel I, I, was, I got very influenced by. And the idea that, you know, live dance, live music, um, all the, these things have, are, are, are more exciting to experience viscerally than 
uh, on a recording or, uh, or on a screen. And so I tend to try, I've tended to incorporate that into my work as well as opera and Chinese opera. Of course, opera. the Chinese opera there yeah. is combined with the music. Trying to find Chinatown with mm -hmm. the electric violin, that's just an amazing scene yeah, thank in you. that play. Uh, labels. Let's, Miller was often labeled as a Jewish American playwright, and he resisted labels. So he thought they were too limiting. Yet, Chris Bigsby, in his critical study of Miller, uh, said that Miller's default setting was Jewish. Now, you've certainly been labeled. Mm -hmm. What's your default setting? Um, I appear to continue to be interested <laughs> in East-West <laughs> issues. And uh, when I, uh, I put it that way because, in a way, I don't really understand, I don't completely understand why uh, anymore. Because certainly a lot of the work that I've done, which is not my original work, uh, whether it's in opera or in musicals or whatever, um, or film, uh, doesn't revolve around, necessarily revolve around East-West themes. Yet when I go back to my own little patch of soil, yeah. um, it seems to, um, I seem to come back to this. Right. It's, it's changed a little in the sense that it has become more international now than it, and, and it was much more uh, Chinese-American uh, when I was starting out. But I guess I still have unfinished business um, personally, psychologically, yeah. socially, whatever, uh, on this subject. So I guess my default <laughs> position continues to be uh, plays that uh, tackle this kind of east-west east stories yeah. in one way or another. Have you had a problem, it's hard to say, some, some playwrights do, with the labeling limiting audience? Like, you know. Because if you do that, then it seems to, to me limit uh, the subject and the experience, f or take it away from that search for the larger American identity, which which Miller was at, Lorraine Hansberry was at, yeah. you're at. So if you label you an Asian American playwright, it seems. To me. I think it can be. It it's certainly can, it's reductive, yeah. and it's not actually accurate in this in the in the, in yeah. the sense that you know it uh, it tends to limit the way that one per can perceive the work. On the other hand, I feel like everybody gets labeled one way or another, yeah, right. um, and that's just the nature of the culture that we yeah, live in. Right. So if you think about David Mamet, for instance, you don't necessarily think about him in terms of his, his ethnicity, but you think about, oh, it's a very male-driven play, yes. it's very kind of testosterone, he has a lot of F-bombs. And that's not necessarily, tr that's not true of his yeah, entire body yeah. of work. Right. So everybody gets kind of reduced Wait. in some way. And then lately, I started to think, you know, if you, they can't label you, um, they sometimes don't write about you as oh, much. Okay. Because they're, they're writers that I can think of playwrights who I think are fantastic playwrights who have, you know, have perfectly good careers but can't be you know, mm -hmm. put in a box as easily. And then sometimes they, it gets a little mushy when people right. try to write about them. They don't know what to call them. Um, so. And then on the other side of the labeling is basically so many of the plays are about identity characters. Mm -hmm searching yeah. for identity, whether it's Chinese American, American, I mean, bondage, that play completely strips away identity. And in that moment, when they take off the masks, mm -hmm. you know, the identity is just revealed in that. So it was fascinates me about your, for me, the strain in all your work is all these characters challenging each other's identity at the same time, searching for the, their identity and, the, and the assumption that they make about other characters Identity, identity, for example, uh, when Ama and Popo in, <laughs> in Family Devotions, uh, when they're torturing Di mm -hmm. th that, that, that that's the moment in that play, you know, yeah. they're trying to understand the Christianity and his sense of communism. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if we're ever going to find that, solve, solve that search for identity in American drama, but we're still searching for it. That's well, I mean, I think identity in general, yeah. it's not just in, you know, not even only in American drama. Yeah. Certainly that question, who am I, yes. is, is, a, is a fundamental human question across any culture. Um, it takes on a particular American color, so yeah. to speak, uh, because of the immigration experience. Sure. Um, but um, I don't know that that's, uh, certainly the question of who am I is not yeah, going to go yeah. away. Uh, uh, a lot of religion in your work, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, the Miller thing. Miller, at the end of his life, described himself as a Jewish atheist. <laughs> it's kind of contradictory. I mm -hmm. was going to be a cultural Jew, too, but it, I, I always loved the way he said that. Uh, so much of your work uses religion 
and particularly showing the effects of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And you've talked about your uh, being raised as a fundamentalist. So where are you now with how you're using religion, seeing religion? Well, I, I, I feel like if I look at, you know, there's three kind of explicitly religious plays that I, I've done, uh, uh, Family Devotions, Rich Relations, and Golden Child. And I feel that it kind of represents a progression yeah. towards um, first, you know, feeling very hostile towards religion, and then by the time you get to Golden Child, there's at least a kind of humanistic yeah. understanding of it. Um, and at this point, I find myself kind of comfortable with liberal Christianity, with sort of mainland Protestant, mainline Protestant denominations that you know have sort of uh, what would be called liberal political and social values. So they kind of line up with my own values, but they also connect to a tradition that I grew sure. up with. That said, I don't can't say I go to church every week. So. <laughs> uh, let's go back to you meeting Miller mm -hmm. uh, in you saw him at O'Neill, and what about in '99? When you met and when your wife well, was in the, yeah, ninety nine, my wife was in yes. the Bob Falls, you know, uh, production of Death for Sales Foresight, right? Uh, yes, Foresight. Uh, and um, they tended to go out to steakhouses a lot. That oh. particular company, <laughs> um, so I <laughs> joined them for a, a, you know a, a few meals, but again, I have to say I was, you know, even in ninety nine, I was kind of too. Sh I just felt, you know, I'm not worthy. Um, yeah, and um, so I didn't actually have an exchange with him, but I did get a book autographed. Oh, there you go. Yeah. But I didn't go, I'm a playwright. I just, <laughs> it just but didn't. He must have known. We, I mean, he knew. I don't know. 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 Did he? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think he probably would have known what M. Butterfly sure, was, whether sure. he knew that I was the guy who wrote okay. M. Butterfly. I don't know. You don't know. Yeah. I actually searched for the commented on you in those last years. I couldn't find anything yeah, right I'm now. Not, I'm, I'm not aware. on that play. Yeah. 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 It's, it's interesting. Uh, now, let's, let's talk about the state of contemporary theater, <laughs> okay. something that interests all of us. Miller again railed against the commercialization of Broadway, the Disneyfication of Broadway that he always said made it very difficult to produce the kind of dramas that he and Williams and Albee wrote in the 60s and 70s and 50s. But yet, you have worked really successfully uh, in those very areas that Miller criticized. I mean, he wrote the book mm -hmm. by Ida and Disney's Tarzan and Flower Drum Song. Uh, having said that, what do you think about the conditions for producing your kinds, Miller's kind of drama, and I know you have the thing is about this, the profitability impulse that drives American theater. I'm only saying because you were, when you won that Steinberg Award, mm -hmm. you talked about how that money would help you write your plays full time, yeah. and how that you talked about how it surprised people, how what you only made out of mm -hmm. Chinglish and that. And so th that was really fascinating. So I was just wondering. Yeah. Um, I mean, in some ways, sometimes it's the, it's, you know, it's the best of times and the worst of times. In terms of commercial theater, um, Broadway is probably healthier than it's been I, I, through my adult lifetime right now and closer to the center of American popular culture than it's been since the 1950s. So that's the good news. The bad news is that, therefore, Broadway pulls the cart of the entire field in a way that uh, it didn't used to and that I don't think is particularly healthy. And as you, as you note, I'm not anti-Broadway at all. I mean, I've worked for Disney, and I, I, I like some of these very commercial parts of Broadway. But it seems to me that Broadway has to exist in a larger ecology where that recognizes um, that works which are not meant to make money and will never make money are just as important, if not more yes. important, than the works that do make money. And that's why so many of them start in, in, out there in, in the regions. Right. And in the workshops, right? Exactly. I mean, there's not, it, it is incredibly difficult to find an example of a major American play that was developed uh, specifically for right. Broadway. I mean, right. M. Butterfly happens to right. be one of right. them, but that was, you know, at this point, 20 odd mm -hmm. years ago. Um, I mean, even Chinglish, you did, you did it. You and Chinglish, we did first. it at the Goodman first. first. Right. So I feel like, uh, just as I believe that there needs to be an ecology for the American theater, when I look at my own just personal um, writing life, there are also, uh, I believe in having kind of an ecology and a mix of things. So there's work that I do that's commercial work uh, and uh, work that's 
personal in terms of the plays. And when I write the plays, I don't expect, and I don't, and I, I don't, uh, I don't try to make them commercial. I don't know what that means. I mean, I didn't write M Butterfly to be commercial. Yes. Um, so the because I do some commercial work, I feel that that leaves the plays in a fairly um, um, kind of sacred place where I can just write what I'm interested in. And then whatever happens to them is whatever happens to them. There are some critics who said that the early part of this decade uh, was a sort of fallow period in, in American drama, that the great works were just not there. I say like the golden age, you know, between Glass Menagerie and One Day's Journey and Tonight. Mm -hmm. But we do go through cycles. There's no, mm -hmm. no doubt about that. I mean, when you think about the years that you won your, when, the years you won your Tony, I mean, Fences was 87, mm -hmm. you were 88, M. Butterfly was 88, Heidi Chronicles were 89, Lost in Yonkers was 91 yeah. and 92, and then Angels in America. But mm -hmm. I mean, those, those, are those are masterpieces and they're defining plays. So we do go through that ebb and flow. Now, uh, uh, the last two or three years, other oh, Desert Cities, the Assembled Parties, Clybourne Park, mm -hmm. Vanya and Sasha and Sonia and Spike, yeah. perhaps August Osage County. So I'm asking, it seems we're going to another, a, a very different era now. Yeah, I feel like the quality of American playwriting right now is as good as it's ever been. And we can rail against the commercialism of our theater and the way in which Broadway um, rules everything. And I do rail about yeah. those things. That said, um, there's a lot of great young writers yes. out there and, and sort of a wonderful crop of plays. Um, I'd say for the past four or five yeah. years. Um, so something is okay so about it too. Right. Uh, now, are most of these works going to get to Broadway? No. no. Uh, overwhelmingly, they're not. But that's not what Broadway's uh, primarily about. You go, your play goes to Broadway because some producer believes he can make money off of it. Um, and so long as we're willing to, I, I just think it's important that we respect the entire mm -hmm. ecology and we don't put too much emphasis on Broadway. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, Chris Bigsby said that he thinks some of the most important American dramatic writing now is on television. Uh, and certainly cable, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, has redefined or opened up the field in that. Uh, and many critics talk about this being a golden age, uh, this being a golden age. Now you've done your fair share of TV and film writing, so how does the writing for the stage fit into the mixture of this broadcast entertainment? Well, you know, I actually, I've done my fair, fair amount of film writing, but I've not done a lot of TV writing. I wrote one uh, miniseries that wasn't very yeah. good, and, um, but I've never done series yeah. television. Um, and so, yes, I, like everybody else, <laughs> have, have been really kind of drawn into television over the last 10 years, and I never thought that uh, yes. I would get to the point where I would feel guilty for not watching enough TV. Yeah. But there's, there's amazing work going on in television, and... How does it all fit in? Um, in a, I'm I actually, you know, have been uh, have a, uh, an idea for a series that um, is appears to be going forward at the moment, um, and just because um, it seems like you can do this kind of high quality work, yeah, right. and uh, so I got uh, bitten by the bug a little. Is that, would it be a, ser a, a, a drama series? Or uh, yeah, it, it'd, it'd be yeah. a sort of one-hour drama, yeah. um, a cable drama. Mm -hmm. And so the, I'm still learning about television writing, but it feels to me more similar than film writing. Yeah. Because film writing is um, e essentially the story, is the narrative is told in images, mm -hmm. and the dialogue supports that. Um, but in plays and in television, the story is more told through dialogue, and so, so it feels to me there's a little more affinity. Well, writing for TV. I, I, did, you, did you write the screenplay for, for Chinglish, or is I am working on the screenplay working on the for, Chinglish. for Chinglish. Yeah, because uh, here's a suggestion: the Chinglish would make a tremendous sitcom. I mean, I can imagine mm -hmm. every episode in a week a different experience of a businessman in China and how everything. It's confused. In well, I have my, bit, my, thank yeah. you, but my idea for my series, yeah. although it's a, it's a one hour, right. is um, it's not Chinglish, but it's, it's sort of in that yeah, world, yeah, and yeah. I expect yeah. it to be, you know, have a lot of comic elements. Oh, so. that's great. Well, let, let's talk about Chinglish, because 
I, I think you've, you've created a new form oh, with that play. Uh, Miller, at the end of his career, said, finally said, he said, when it all comes down to it, it's all about the language. Mm -hmm. All about the language. Now, Leah Silverman, the director, mm -hmm. said that, I think we were doing it at the Goodman, she said, language is a character in that play. And I think more than any other play I know, so much of that play relies on what gets lost in translation, mm -hmm. both inadvertently and consciously, kind of on the motivations and the mistakes of the characters. So uh, how did you come up with that, and particularly that technique of the, the translation literally there on the stage for you in, in all its forms? Well, it's you know, I feel like I struggled with, with um, how to represent bilingualism yeah. through a lot, of, a lot of my career. Um, and so by the time I, I got to Chinglish, I knew I wanted to write a play about a, you know American businessman in, in China. My, my thought was I want to write Glengarry Glen Ross set in China. Uh, and then I felt, you know, to be honest about it, you have to deal with the issue of language. Because uh, I'm not particularly bilingual. I mean, I took some Chinese in college, but I don't really speak. So I, I, I face that language barrier when I go to China. Yeah, you said you went to China and you encountered what kind of translation issues? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I encountered, as a lot of people yeah. do in China, particularly um, back five or six years ago, uh, a lot of the chinglish yeah, signs, yeah. you know, the, 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 the handicapped restrooms yeah, that say deformed the one, man's toilet. That's the one I deformed man, and you actually saw that. Yeah, um, and I began to think of writing a play around that. Um, so the, I think it's because I'd worked in opera so much, yeah. and I'd seen a lot of my, my words um, on super titles okay. that I began to go, well, why can't you do that in a play? Why can't you have super titles in a play? So um, that, was, that, that was how the kind of form yeah. idea for Chinglish came to be. Yeah, it, it's, it was just a brilliant idea. And, I think, and the way the audience perceives all the mistakes in the translation, I mean, especially those, because you have three separate scenes with three separate mm -hmm. translators. Yeah. You see how they all get it wrong, well, well, depending on their motives. Yeah. Right? Do, I, began to realize at a certain point form-wise yeah. that it was the same mechanism through which um, farce works. Because in farce, okay. the audience is ahead of the characters. Yes. We know the mistress is hiding in the closet. And so we are, take a sort of godlike position yeah. and watch the, the screwing about of mortals uh, uh, who are trying to hide that. And similarly in Chinglish, it's, it's, it's uh, with language. We know what everybody on stage is saying, but they don't necessarily know. Let's talk about the, the new play, Kung Fu. I'm fascinated by you telling the story of, of, of Bruce Lee and how, how, how that evolved in you. And I'm especially fascinated because you, so much of your work has dealt with deconstructing stereotypes. And certainly Kung Fu, you've chosen a great title mm -hmm. rather than Bruce Lee. It, because it's such a striking term for us in the way we've experienced American culture from in TV and film. You know, you can go from Kung Fu and mm -hmm. in the 70s to Kung Fu Panda. Yeah. So how are you approaching Bruce Lee well, as, as a character? Um, it's interesting, let's, this relates to this question of language. Yes. Um, because I had the idea kind of in the mid-90s to do a show about Bruce Lee. And at that point, I contacted Linda, his widow. Mm -hmm. And she was very supportive. Uh, and I initially thought of it as a musical. So throughout most of the aughts, you know, from 2000 to about 2010, I worked on trying to create a Bruce Lee musical. And just couldn't really get it. I was working some, with some great collaborators, but you know, the script wasn't coming, and it just wasn't um, happening. So that project fell apart. But then I kept wanting to, the story continued to intrigue me. And at a certain point, I felt, you know, the problem here is trying to make it a musical. Because every time we had Bruce Lee sing, it felt very kind of uh, South Parky yeah, and not yeah, a good yeah, way. Yeah. Um, so why couldn't you do what I'm now kind of calling a dancical, which is okay. it's like a musical in that it has scenes and it has numbers, but the numbers uh, don't involve singing. They involve martial arts, they involve dance, okay. and they're underscored with music, but nobody has to sing. And so the dance moves the story forward the way a song would in a musical. Okay. So once I found that, it was relatively easy to, to get a script that I liked. And the other key was, was language. Because I think generationally, 
I grew up with this idea that, oh, if I'm going to write a Chinese character, um, I, I can't write broken English. That broken English is demeaning. And through Chinglish, I began to realize by writing the character of Xi'an and some of her broken English that you now there's something, there can, broken English can be cool. Um, and so by the time I got to doing Bruce Lee in this new version, in the sort of Kung Fu version, um, the reality is he's, uh, he was a troubled kid from Hong Kong who didn't do very well in school, who showed up in Seattle. Um, at the age of 18, and his English wasn't very good. And I should just acknowledge yeah, okay. that. Um, and even by the time you get to the end of his career, by the time you look at um, him in, uh, in Enter the Dragon, for instance, you know, his English isn't wonderful. So that kind of, I, I realized I had been prejudiced against writing a character with broken English. And once I started to write him, kind of struggling with the language, and the language representing the, the, the kind of uh, aggression and the, the fighting impulse, that it was in the, the dialogue itself, mm -hmm. then it just kind of started to spill out of mm -hmm. it. Uh, large cast? That you have so many Relatively large yeah. cast. Um, it's um, eight actors, who are all of whom are also either martial artists or dancers, and then an ensemble of four that only do movement. So choreographer, and, and, and is, is Lee Silverman Lee Silverman directing is directing, and, and, and we have um, or choreographers, actually. I was going to say the choreography must be very complicated. Yeah, we it's have a martial arts choreographer, um, uh, Dodo Huang from Shanghai, who has a fusion style, um, a, a Chinese opera choreographer, and then sort of an overall executive choreographer. Okay, and it, this is January, February at the scene. Uh, we go into rehearsal January third, and we open February twenty fourth. Okay, great. Final question, because uh, we talked about the, you said mentioned how Frank Rich has always been kind to you. Uh, the critics. Is a good, okay. Miller said in his autobiography in Time Bends that he had his success despite the fact that I never had a critic in my corner in this country. Hmm. Uh, so at this point in Korea, how do you see your critical evaluation? Well, I mean, if we just look at the New York Times, yes. which, is, you know, which is not as important as it used to be. but You can mention names if you like. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll just say it. I mean, I was, I was lucky to have a critic who was in my corner yes. early in my career, Frank Rich, yes. and then Ben Brantley and I haven't really he seen eye to eye. He doesn't seem to. But, um, you know, in a, at first that was frustrating. Now why do you think that is? I don't, you know, uh, I, mean, I don't have a real yeah, explanation. Yeah, yeah. It's just our aesthetic doesn't yeah, seem to match yeah. up. Um, and it helps you realize, A, how kind of arbitrary the yeah. critical yes. situation is. Because had, uh, fr had M. Butterfly come in two years later, um, Frank Rich is no longer yes. the head critic. Dave Richards was the head yeah. critic. And Dave Richards was the same person who, when he was the lead critic of the Washington Post, mm -hmm. panned M. Butterfly out of town yeah. prior to coming to Broadway. Mm -hmm. So M. Butterfly would have been a flop yeah. if it had come in two years yeah. later. Um, so you start to realize that. And then also, I think it's particularly satisfying at this point in my life that I continue to have a good career without yeah. the support it's of the York right. Times. Yeah, because you're saying the power of the critics. I mean. Uh, that piece that Alec Baldwin wrote last yeah, season. Uh, Alex Mitchell. Uh, Alex uh, Mitchell, yeah. Over, over or Orphans mm -hmm. was... Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, no, you're talking uh, about, you are talking Baldwin about Alec Baldwin, yes. After the critics panned mm -hmm. that... And this is my personal and critical opinion. I saw that production. I took a group of students to see mm -hmm. that. That show was really... It, I redefined that play for me. Yeah. And I understand why I got, it, it did get mixed. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. Reviews and, and Baldwin was accurate. Yeah. In in, in what he wrote. So. Yeah, I agree. And um, also, as, as the power of the Times is yes. less than it used yes, to be. Yes, that's true. And um, in a way, the you know, there's a downside to the power of critics being um, less than they used to be. In that, particularly on Broadway, it's become much more star driven yeah, because yeah, that's absolutely. what people go for absolutely. now. Absolutely. Uh, but there's an upside too yeah. in that it. Was it, I, th I believe it was Arthur Miller who said that, um, it, you know, when, the when there was a Soviet Union, that there's no yeah. one person in the Soviet Union who has more power over what people do or do not see yeah. in the theater yeah. than the head yeah. critic of the New York Times, or something like that. Yeah. Um, and that's not, just not a smart system. Yeah. Well, this was wonderful. I want to thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, we'll do it again. Okay. Thank you very much.